Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Sams. I'm the preacher for the Judson Road Church of Christ in Longview, Texas. Thank you for joining me this Wednesday afternoon as we continue our series of studies looking at the gospel sermons that are presented in the book of Acts today. We're looking at Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 is the apostles Paul and Barnabas are in three different cities, Iconium, Lustra, and Derbe, and we're really going to focus in on Paul's time there in the city of Lustra. So if you've got your New Testament, be opening up to Acts chapter 14 and verse 8. And let's get started with the first of our three questions. Number one, why is Paul speaking here? Well, for the same reason he's been speaking since back at the end of chapter 12, he is still on that first missionary journey being sent out from Antioch. And so we should expect him on these missionary journeys where he was called by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel to be doing just that, preaching the gospel. And so we see in Acts chapter 14 and verse 7, they were preaching the gospel. Iconium and Lustra and Derbe mark the end of his route, and he turns around in Derbe and heads back to Antioch by way of the cities which he had previously visited. And so in each stop, what is he doing? He is there preaching the gospel. And what is particularly noteworthy as we come to Lustra in chapter 14 and verse 8 is that Paul begins his efforts not by entering the synagogue, but by healing a paralyzed man, a man who had been born paralyzed, who had never walked in his life. Chapter 14 and verse 8, In Lustra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple, from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up, straight on your feet. And he leaped, and he walked. And now when the people saw that, uh, rather, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lacinian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. So his efforts here in the city, as they begin with the healing of this paralyzed man, shocks the city's residents to the point that they think Paul and Barnabas are gods. And so they begin to try to worship them, and from that opening, Paul is going to have an opportunity to preach the gospel. So to whom is he speaking? Well, we get an idea there, but we can refine it a little bit more. Paul begins by speaking to these idolatrous residents of Lustra, right? They think Paul and Barnabas, verse 11, are gods, and they called Barnabas, verse 12, Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. So these are Greek gods, if you want to call it polytheism or mythology, that seem to be strong in this area. And so they identify Paul and Barnabas as Zeus and Hermes. And they are so enthralled with Paul and Barnabas that even the religious leaders of the city, the priests of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, are bringing out animals to begin to offer as sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. So this is the, the crowd, the people to which... Paul and Barnabas are speaking to which, uh, or, or to whom they are presenting the gospel. But it's interesting that that these people seem to be very, very. Could we say easily swayed? They have seen this miracle occur, and they have a different reaction than any other group of people we see in the Book of Acts. They immediately think Paul and Barnabas are these Greek gods, and they begin to try to worship them and offer sacrifices to them. Now, we remember Cornelius earlier uh, tried to worship Peter at one point. Peter forbade that. But this seems altogether different. This is a large group of people. A large group of people who, a little while later, are going to be just as easily swayed against Paul. In verse 19, Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. So while at one moment this group of people is considering Paul to be a Greek god, a few moments later they are content to stone him and to drag him outside of the city and to leave him there for dead. So we're not dealing with a, a very stable group of people here, are we? 
It's a group of people who can be caught up very quickly in their fascinations. And when things don't turn out as they think they should, they turn on people. And that's just exactly what they did to Paul. That is to whom Paul is speaking. Now let's notice what Paul had to say as he was speaking to them. As we look at verses 8, 9, and 10, his initial foray into Lustra there, Paul simply spoke to the paralyzed man. There was nothing deep, there was nothing necessarily insightful or, or deep and theologically meaningful when he spoke to this paralyzed man. He simply says, stand up straight on your feet. Now, uh, Paul had been speaking prior to this, no doubt preaching the gospel, as verse 7 tells us, and the paralyzed man had been hearing Paul speak and observing him intently. But what Paul said to the paralyzed man was simply stand up, straight on your feet. And that's exactly what the paralyzed man did. What else did Paul say? Well, he refused to be treated as deity. He refused their their overtures to worship him. In chapter 14 and verse 15, uh, actually in verse 14, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you. And preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. Paul affirmed that his nature was the same as any of them. He had a human nature just like they did. And so he affirmed he was not God. But while he was not God, he was pointing them to the true God. Not Zeus, not Hermes, not any of the multiplicity of Greek gods but to the living God, to the true God. Not a useless God, but the God who made heaven, earth, the sea, and everything that is in it. And going on from there, Paul testified about God's existence and his self-witness. Verse 16, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. That implies God's power over them. Verse 17, nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness and that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and with gladness. God was living compared to Zeus, Hermes, and the other of the Greek gods, who Paul refers to as useless things, perhaps pointing to the temple of Zeus or pointing to statues and idols dedicated to these Greek gods. And Paul testified of God's self-witness. That there is evidence for God outside of his word, and it's in the very universe that he created and put us in the midst of. We are to look at that creation. As uh, the 19th Psalm would tell us, we are to look at that creation uh, as Romans 1 would tell us. And to see in that creation the brilliant mind and the powerful hand of God. Now, taking all that into account, what can we take away from what Paul said here. Admittedly, we don't have a text here like we do in Acts 2, like we do in Acts 3, where we have a long monologue style gospel sermon. We get bits and pieces all throughout chapter 14 of these different messages that Paul shared. But as we look at them and try to take away something for ourselves, either as preachers or as members who are sitting in church pews on Sundays and Wednesdays and expecting to be fed with the word, what can we learn from, from Paul in his, in his time in Lustra? Well, we learn that miracles were observable, verifiable, and, well, miraculous. I know we're not supposed to define a term by using the term itself, but that's really all that I can think of to describe this. Uh, once again, we're seeing miracles done in, in an observable way. This was a man who had never walked that people knew, and now suddenly he's standing up leaping and walking. It was verifiable. People could go and look and see and judge that this, yeah, this was the guy that we have known all along who was born lame but is now walking. And miracles are, are by nature miraculous, right? Paralyzed people don't begin to walk at the sound of a voice. Uh, we have people spending billions of dollars today trying to figure out how to restore that ability to walk to people who, who have lost it. But we know beyond the shadow of a doubt, it's not accomplished by speaking to them. 
But that's what happened here. It's a miracle. It's something that, that goes in the face of the natural and the ordinary. Paul spoke to this man, and the man stood up and walked. When we hear people talking about miracles today, when we hear people trying to defend their various religious beliefs and practices and ideas by quote-unquote miracles that are done, we need to remind ourselves what the Bible presents to us, what God and His Word presents to us about miracles. Miracles were observable, verifiable, and miraculous. And if what people are calling on us to see as miracles today are not observable and are not verifiable and, quite frankly, are not miraculous, then they're not miracles. We're seeing a miracle here in Acts chapter 14, and we need to appreciate that. Here's something else to think about as well. Those with a human nature are unworthy of worship. Right? Paul rejected worship just as Peter did back in Acts chapter 10 because he possessed a human nature. That is his express language here. Verse 15, we also are men with the same nature as you. He possessed human nature, and so he was unworthy of worship. Somebody might say, well, well what about Jesus? Well, Jesus was rightly worshipped, we see, in John chapter 9 and verse 38, as well as other passages, because his nature was divine. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? Jesus did not have a human nature. He had a divine nature, a divine nature that he limited in coming to, in flesh in the form of a servant, Philippians chapter 2 and other passages would tell us. But Jesus' existence, as we have studied elsewhere, did not begin in Bethlehem. It did not begin in Mary's arms. Jesus was rightly worshipped because his nature was and is divine. He was there at the beginning because he is God. He is divine himself. And then let me submit this last point to you. That as we look at what Paul had to say and what Paul did here in Lustra, we're reminded that we must not forget our fellow disciples. We see Paul and Barnabas spending a lot of time here traveling to different cities and presenting the gospel for the first time. But we need to make sure that we're following the pattern that we see from them in our own lives. You notice that their efforts were not simply focused on alien sinners, those who were on the outside. Because Paul is going to turn around while he's in Derbe. And in verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lustra and Iconium and Antioch, verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. We need rightly to share the gospel with those who have never heard it before. But just as surely as those people need our time and energy, so also do our brethren. Our brethren who need to be encouraged, who are facing difficulty, who, verse 22, may be facing tribulations and trials. We need to be willing to take time out of our lives to encourage them and to help them make sure they enter the kingdom of God and that they too are serving the Lord in whom they have believed. Thanks for joining me this afternoon in this study of Paul's message to the, to the people there in Lustra and Derbe and Iconium. I hope you have a great rest of your week. I hope you have power now. We finally got ours back late last night, and we're thankful for that. I hope you have a good rest of your week, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Take care.